Okay, continuing the 50 chapters from the book that God dictated to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. And quite frankly, as he dictated the books of the prophets to the prophets. The entirety of the Hebrew Bible is by his command and direction. It's all his, every bit of it. And you can see it in the prophets by the way some of the books go together. From prophets that didn't even live in the same time. To know it's the day of the Lord, you got to combine, actually, Isaiah, of course, 11 and 53. Jeremiah 31 is the most important. Uh, because it says, when the land blooms again, the ruined cities restored, and Jerusalem rebuilt, I'll make a new covenant with you. Okay, it's a covenant of sin forgiveness. I'll write tour on your heart, and all shall heed me. For I shall forgive your sins and iniquities and remember them no more. Same thing he did with the exiles. They became a holy seed and built the second temple. Well, God's returning. If he's giving out, if he's making a covenant, he's returning. Okay, that takes you to Malachi 3, which is the only place you can find the covenant that you desire. God says, I'm sending my messenger before me to clear the way. I'm returning to my temple. And the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. Elijah's the messenger, by the way. He's the one that clears the way. It's not Moshe. So, let me get situated here. <laughs> Torah written on every heart. Chapter 11. No, I'm not sinning. There. Chapter 11. Torah written on every heart. Again. This is God's writing. Now, I live a lot because I know all this so thoroughly, having been taught it, uh, wrote blogs on it, turned the blogs into the book, and now I've been doing the videos since COVID. Uh, the ones we originally did had just seen too much wear and tear. God just kept having me repost them. Um, you know, re-download, re-upload, and they're just, we pretty much phased them out. I don't see them coming up anymore. I redid all 50 chapters last week, and uh, they've been posted seven times, and they're already starting to show a little wear, so we're doing it again. We're going to keep them uh, looking decent, which I'm quite happy about. Okay, this is from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, verses 31 through 34. See, a time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke. Though I espouse them that would be married or adopted anyway, them, declares the Lord, but such is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days, declares the Lord. I will put my teaching into their innermost being and inscribe it upon their hearts. Then I will be their God and they shall be my people. Okay, that's the original covenant. Israelites, if you uh, will do all that uh, I have Moses tell you, all my commandments, laws, and rules, I will be your God. And to a man they had gathered as one man Israel. It's only happened two times, but this is the first one. And to a man they agreed. And uh, he became their God, and the Jewish people became uh, <clears throat> uh, his people, his chosen, his children, his bride. He's got all kinds of names. <clears throat> no longer will they need to teach one another and say to one another, Heed the Lord. For all of them, from the least of them to the greatest, shall heed me, declares the Lord. For 
for I will forgive their sins and their, their, no, I will forgive their iniquities and remember their sins no more. The covenant to write Torah on every heart is fulfilled by amending the original covenant from strict compliance to being, quote, mindful of the teachings of my servant Moses, whom I charged at order with laws and rules for all of Israel. Close quote. You can find that in Malachi 3. It's mindful. He's saying be mindful. It's not strict compliance. Every sect of Judaism is going to have to determine of their own what that really means and if they're going to change their ways or not. But it's being mindful, and it's going to help me draw people that, that I need to make righteous to remove their guilt. Because I offered myself for guilt, but it's to remove guilt. And I'm the one that goes through all the wounding, punishment, uh, suffering, crushing, bruising, chastisement, and maltreatment. Now you haven't been maltreated until God does it to you. It's in his power and his words. To change me, he takes somebody with a fiery spirit like Moses, like Ezekiel, believe it or not, and myself. But then he just beats you down to where it doesn't even mean anything. You can't <laughs> you, you, you just lose the edge you used to have when you were just mean. <laughs> He's changed me greatly. And I laugh so much more than I ever did in my life. And uh, he, that's the other book he dictated to me, The Life of God's Righteous Servant, which is my life. And it shows how I fit Isaiah 53. And, and I'm the only person who's ever been able to explain it properly. God wrote it that way. He did it on purpose. And I've explained that in plenty of videos. But, you know, you can find God's fire refinement where he's straightening a prophet up. In uh, uh, Jonah, Job, Ezekiel particularly. Ezekiel's like the key to Isaiah 53 and understanding it. And, uh, of course, in 53 itself, you have all those words, I call them the big six, wounded, punished, chastised, maltreated, crushed, and bruised. <clears throat> but they all apply to me. But I'm not taking it in a vicarious manner. It just means I'm in the fire of refinement so that I can be the teacher of righteousness who makes the many righteous with my knowledge, not by human sacrifice or blood, but it, it is written so that you can't figure it out. I, he wanted it such that only the man described could explain it. And that's me. The purpose... Oh, there's four right... Uh, you know, there's only six prophecies left that are unfulfilled. Four righteous men to come. And this is the time to come. And two covenants. Covenant of friendship... And this Jeremiah covenant of sin forgiveness, which I'm going to be explaining a lot more. Four, okay, that's Elijah, the prophet like Moses, Moshiach, and the man actually described in Isaiah 53. You got four righteous servants, but only one description. I'm all four. Yeah. I've already written two books dictate to me what 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 is that you unique about Moses? Well, there's the Exodus, of course, of which there's no need for today. But God dictated the Torah to him. He dictated a book to him. And how do we know? Because Moses could not have possibly known the information of the first five books of the Bible. He just couldn't know. Any more than I could know this. This is my first and foremost proof is this book that we keep putting on video because apparently people don't care to read much because I can tell when somebody goes to WordPress and is looking at uh, the book itself. And it's pretty rare. It doesn't happen much. Mindful of the teachings of my servant Moses by those who heed, fear, and revere his name and giving everyone a clean slate 
free of all sins, rather than all the people in compliance and animal sacrifice for forgiveness. That's how. All of which is in part to draw the many and the multitude back to Judaism by the teachings of God's righteous servant. And this is what Elijah does in Malachi 3. Recounseling parents with children and children with their parents. And doing it through Judaism. God's lost. Everybody get together and go to synagogue together. So he's doing the same thing. Elijah's doing the same thing the righteous servant is said to do. Prophet like Moses, God's veritable mouthpiece on earth and a writer of his words. Moshiach, well, King David was instrumental in gathering all the materials for the first temple. Solomon actually had it built. King David passed away. Uh, they sometimes call it Solomon's Temple. <clears throat> uh, so, along with the messenger, the lines are clearing the way for God to return to his temple, which means being uh, instrumental in getting it built. So is, so is David. So, you know, their purposes kind of coexist with each other. And the last thing is, why did God send a light, uh, take Elijah to heaven? By name, specifically. The only person in the Hebrew Bible. And he returns in the day of the Lord. What do you ask Elijah? Tell us about heaven, if you're Elijah. Okay, several chapters in this book had to do with heaven itself. And I've been there many times in vision. He would teach me in my very room. I can expect to have. I know what the entertainment is. I know what the meeting places are or like, and, and I know what, what, what to tell you to expect. And it's all in the book for the most part. The purpose of Elijah as the messenger of the new cup, this is now God's words, that's me ad lipping again. The purpose of Elijah as the messenger of the new covenant and recounselor of the Jewish families is similar to the original covenant when God spent 40 years in the desert with Moses, teaching the laws and rules for all Israel, God charged them with at order. And he became their God and they became his people is repeated in the amended new covenant. That's what it is. It's an amended confirmation to be made in a time to come. When God again says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. So, in the desert for 40 years with Moses as the messenger and teacher of the laws and rules of God for all Israel and all the experiences of the people when God dwelt among the tents of the Israelites is what this means. I will put my teaching into the innermost being and inscribe it upon their heart. God will once again be dwelling and moving among his people. That's why he, he says in the covenant of friendship, I'm going to place my uh, temple on Mount Zion. He knows it's not there right now. He's come early. Uh, but, you know, myself, I couldn't get that done. I mean, I can't believe the Jewish people hadn't built a temple. You know, forget the temple mount. He didn't want anything to do with it anyway. Just has to be on Mount Zion. I know all the problems with trying to get it up there with the Golden Dome Mosque and Jordan controlling it and on and on. The the Muslim third holiest site they say. So what what this really comes down to is everybody's got a clean slate, but they gotta hear about it. They will have it when I get these books published. There's chapters that literally say that. Now, these covenants are, are, there's some variants to that, but for the most part, it's, it's so that all Jews throughout the world, God will have a big publisher, um, will have access to it, God's new scripture. Now, hear about it. But basically, they're going to be teaching themselves when they learn about heaven, because it's a Jewish heaven, and, and you don't have a mind. God has to be the information of your mind for you to think. And he's going to do that with all things Jewish. Judaism, uh, Hebrew Bible, Talmud, 
food, history, famous people, anything and everything Jewish will be the information of your mind. And he's doing it with me already. I'm, I'm, I'm living that life as though I had no mind. It's like they cut my spirit off from my mind. And that's how he orchestrates my thoughts. But he keeps it in line with who I am and very similar to the way I once thought. But there's a clear difference. But I'm still key. And in heaven, you'll still be you. But it's just a lot different when you don't have a human body. A lot different. I mean, that's hungry or wants to sleep and things like that. You'll have a form. I don't know how that works. He hadn't explained it to me. And in the years it takes, many, this is to get his temple rebuilt, to clear the temple. No, we're not doing that anymore. We're going to take that out. When Moses walked among the tents of the Hebrews, God was with him. You see, the Spirit of God alights upon you. And that's Isaiah 11. Alights upon the twig of the anointed one. The, alight, the Spirit alighting upon you is the anointment. And God is in his Spirit. 11 could have just as well read the Spirit of God and God, and the presence of God, if you will, alighted upon the twig of the shoot of the stump of Jesse. Every one of the prophets of the Jewish people was a man of divine beings because that's how he talks to a man. He comes within you with the person of his spirit who is an angel and most definitely a person um, and manipulates your mind. He makes you, it's as though you're having a conversation with him, but he's doing it by manipulating your mind. The sages wonder, did Moses hear God with his ears? Answer is no. He can make it seem like that, but he rarely does he. That's that's not how it's done. And so immediately the man Moshiach becomes a man of divine beings. And that would include me. This is all real. This is the time to come. That land lay desolate for two thousand years to the Jewish people returned after the Holocaust, created the state of Israel, and started to make it bloom again. Took a lot of toil and a lot of hard work. Restored the old cities, Jaffa, and, you know, just all of them. And, re and Jerusalem is a mighty uh, metropolitan uh, city now. Okay, so when Moses walked, when he walked among the tents, Moses, God was walking amongst the tents because he's within Moses. And you can find that that's actually in the Torah and, and particularly in Ezekiel. And I've already gone over it. When Adam, symbolic of Esau, the brother of Jacob, who never married a Jewish woman, all of his children were Gentiles. And they created, formed Adam. Gentile lands is what it comes to mean. Symbolic of Esau and Christianity and Judaism. They would not, Adam would not let Moses pass through. They did not let God pass through. But in the day of the Lord, God comes from Adam. That's Isaiah 63. Who is this coming from Adam? Gentile lands. And of the peoples, the Jewish people, none are with him. It's coming with the Gentile, at least in the beginning. I'll probably convert because of the prophecy of the prophet like Moses. It's supposed to come from one of you. And he's talking to the Israelites. Uh, but that's up to God. Because God told me, look, I don't care if it gets fulfilled or not. It is important. But you're doing everything Moses did anyway. So we'll get it taken care of. I'm not on the executive committee. I get very little information and nothing of the future and nothing other people are saying or doing. For instance, I have no idea if Toby Singer has, has, has heard me out here in the desert yelling to the high hills, Isaiah 53 is not Israel, etc., etc. But maybe he had. The Jewish people will have the same experience as the Israelites of having a prophet 
in their midst, who is the visible representation of the presence of God and the angel of his presence, who never leave him. Oh, that's me. Never leave me. No. Sister, that's 24 7, 16 years. That's having a lot of God around you. But you got to remember, I'm in the fire. I'm seeing in his backside. Okay, that that's a real tough side. To, to, he even hid Moses in the cliffs of the hill and put his hand over it and said, I'm going to show you my backside. Well, that's all the Satan you'll ever need. I can tell you that. It's just his main side. I mean, he can just, it's not that he turns mean or is mean. He, he can just do things to you that see me and, and it surprises you that he would do it. But he says, that's how I change you. And it doesn't bother me a bit. Your pain means nothing to me, Keith. Do you know how much pain I've seen? I created pain. I created emotions. This is all going to be good, but you've got to go through this. And I'm still in it, and it's gotten worse and tougher every year. It's brutal. I'm not going to go into all the specifics, but I will tell you, he can slam you to the ground in his power, the same cords of the power that surrounded Ezekiel to keep in him from going amongst the people. Cut him off into his house. Cut off from the land of the living. Isaiah 53, 8. See, he matches a lot of the verses. <clears throat> um, in Malachi 3, God makes it clear that he knows many will fear, heed, and revere him, and that many will not. He, may, he points it out. Even when he has forgiven the sins of the Jewish people and remembers them no more. Many of the Jewish people do not believe in God and do not practice Judaism. Only 30% are uh, observant. So, and he knew that when he made the covenant. I know it says all will heed him, but he said, that's what you would expect if I was forgiving everybody's sins. He said, but we all know better. I knew when I told the Israelites what sin was, and not to do it, that they were going to keep sinning. You know, some would come correct. And he says, it's really for them. It's to live a better life. The earth is harsh. But if you follow his rules, commandments, uh, you live the best life you possibly could under whatever circumstances you're in. Yeah, everybody didn't have to be. I hear Jews from Judaism saying, well, if we were all sin free to the best of our abilities, then maybe God will come back. That's no. It's just y'all return, I'll return. Well, you did return, and here he is. See, your time is coming. It's right here. And he can speak through me just like he did Moses. He does it on these videos sometimes. Sometimes I don't even know he's doing it until I rewatch it. I said, wait a minute, that's you saying that. That's not me. <coughs> God has never stopped being the God of Israel and the Jewish people have always been his people. Contrary to teachings in the New Testament and uh, Apostle Paul, I guess it was. Well, the Christians say God left the Jewish people because they wouldn't stop sinning and, and came to the Gentile. That's, that's their, they can't back that up and here God is repeating it. No, I've always been their God. They've always been my people. There's one I think it's a song, it's not a chapter. He tells his people, every one of you can turn your back on me. I'm still not leaving. <laughs> How's that? He can be very funny. But I'm in the fire. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I've cursed him mercifully uh, when I've been in deep pain, really have. Uh, I always feel bad about it. And he said, well, that's part of it. That helps change you. It's brutal. That's all I can tell you. The covenant, I will write to all in your heart, is a metaphor with a degree of hyperbole. God is announcing a new, less strict covenant and says that all the Jewish people will heed him for he will forgive their inequities and remember their sins no more. So it's an amendment with an addition of forgiving the sins. 
And so there'll be a holy seed to build the third temple. It's just a repeat story. He, he forgave the uh, exiles, all 13 tribes that returned. And they did. Read Ezra if you don't believe me. And um, in Isaiah, he forgave them of their sins and iniquities. And they ended up building the second temple. Well, in Jeremiah, it's for the Roman dispersal, the diaspora, which means away from the promised land. Okay, next up is chapter 12, Divine Inspiration of Prophecy Fulfilled. One of my favorites. It is the most blatant manipulation of the New Testament that you can find other than the great lie and deceit from the lips of Jesus himself. They, they go together. These are my top two. Um, there's just flat out something wrong with your book and your uh, unblemished lamb. Who God has a top ten lies of Jesus. I don't know if we put it in a chapter. <laughs> they show up in here. Okay, next up, chapter 12. 